Okay, we're about to start on chapter four here. Um, if you have read chapter four, but part of it already, you're saying you, you've probably got the impression that recursion is like really weird and difficult and, you know, why would we want to use it? And I'm not particularly thrilled with the examples they give in the book, but so today I'm going to be giving some different examples and we'll see how that um, works out. So this is what the book says, and I'm, I'm in total agreement with that. The way we're going to be solving the problem is we're going to break it down into smaller subproblems until we get to something that's trivial to solve and then put the parts back together. And the only thing I would say is that usually recursion involves a method calling itself. I've rarely seen an instance where it wasn't. It may be possible, but I, somebody would have to tell me what that would be. Um, let's talk about things that are broken into smaller and smaller versions of themselves. And the first one is this little visual trick that you might have seen, something like this where we have the vase on a table in front of a painting of a vase in front of a table. Have you ever, you ever seen something like this before? Or you see somebody, they're holding a mirror and there's this infinite number of reflections of themselves. Yeah. So essentially what whoops, we, we have is something that's made up of smaller copies of itself. And one question is, well, when do we stop? And normally the answer is when we stop is when it wouldn't be worth it to you know, be able to see anything useful. So as soon as the resolution gets down to, let's say, less than, you know, 10 by 10 pixels, that's our stopping point. So whenever we're breaking these problems down, that's our trivial solution. The trivial one is it's too small to see. We may as well stop. Um, here's another example of things that are made up of subparts that are a lot like the original. Namely, if y'all have been following the uh, basketball thing, I haven't, but this is a typical tournament that you have. Uh, this is a 16, 16 person tournament. I think it is. Yeah. And that is made up of two eight person tournaments. And each eight person tournament is made up of, let me move this to the side here, two four person tournaments. And then that's going to be. Each one of group of four is a group of two-person tournaments. And finally, we get down to a single individual. And that's when we have to stop because there, there's no further to go. Now, this is a, we're going to be seeing something like this a lot in Chapter 6, by the way, except it's going to be turned on its side. And it's called a binary tree when you have turn it on its side. Okay. Um, usually the root of the tree is going to be at the top and these are going to be at the bottom. Yeah. Just trust me on this. But this is where recursion is going to come in really, really handy because a lot of the operations that you have to do on a tournament like this that's made up of smaller tournaments are the same kind of operations that we're going to be doing recursively on a tree and it's going to make things a lot easier for us. Um, here's another example of things that are made up of subparts that are like the original, only smaller. Here's a linked list. If I were to take away the head of the linked list, what would I be left with? Another linked list. Okay, only smaller. If I were to take the head of this list away, what would I be left with? I'd be left with yet another smaller list. So a linked list you can think of as a head node followed by another linked list. So it's defined in terms of itself. And finally, where's the stopping point? The stopping point is down here when I get to the empty list, because that's where everything just stops. Is everybody okay with this idea that you have a list is a head node followed by a smaller list? In the same way that we had a tournament is a large tournament made up of smaller tournaments and the same way that we had a painting that's made up of smaller paintings. Yeah. So that's the idea of recursion. We're going to take a large problem, make a smaller problem that's just like it and use the same method until we get to something that is trivial to do. 
because I have an empty list. There's nothing to do. So that's about as, as trivial as you can get. Yeah. So this is what the book said again. Usually recursion involves a method calling itself. Okay, well, what happens when a method calls another method, period? Okay, and we've seen that sort of thing before, but I want to go into it in detail and show you what's really happening behind the scenes when Java has a method calling another method. So here we are in main. Main is going to call calc1, and calc1 is going to call calc2. So we have a method that calls another method that calls another method. And we've seen this sort of thing all the time, and there's nothing particularly new or fancy about it. But let's go into the details. And I, you may have seen this in the book last semester. There's something called a stack frame. So right now we're in mains frame. In fact, we're not, hey, we know what a stack is now. Now we can talk about stacks and everybody understands this. So here we are in main and args is the um, variable that we have currently defined. On this in line, I have to allocate room for results. So that goes into my stack frame. And now I'm going to call calc1. When I do that, I open up a new frame on the stack. So now int n is 10 because it got passed in. And now I have something called product. And now to calculate that, I have to call another method. Whenever I call another method, I have to open up another stack frame. So calc2 gets opened up and the 10 gets passed on to that. Is everybody okay on this so far? Again, nothing new here particularly, but now we're seeing it in grand and glorious detail. And then the sum becomes 10 plus five, which is 15. And now what happens when we do a return? Two things happen. First of all, the sum goes back to where we called it from. So essentially, it's as though the 15 replaces the method call. And then the stack frame disappears. So that's what happens when we do a return. Let me go over that again. So when we sit return sum here in calc 2, two things are going to happen. The thing that we're returning is going to replace the method call because that's its return value. And now that we're done with calc2, we're exiting it and its stack frame is no longer necessary. Now we're back in calc1's stack frame. 15 times 6 is 90, and that goes into product. And we're going to return product. Okay, two things are going to happen. The thing that we're returning is going to replace the call that we made originally and the stack frame is going to disappear and now we're back in main and we can print out the result. Yeah. And are there any questions on this one right now? So that's the rule. Every time you call a method, you open up a new stack frame so that it can keep all of its variables local and you don't have any interference with previous calls. And when you return, the return value replaces the call and you pop the stack and you're back, where, back in the environment where you left. Yeah. That's when we have one method calling another method. Now, recursion is a method that calls itself. None of the rules are going to change here. It's just going to look really different. It's going to look maybe a little bit weird, but the rules haven't changed. So let's see how this works when a method calls itself. And we want to find the sum of this linked list, 5, 3, and 7. Well, that's a 5 plus the sum of the smaller list, 3 and 7. What's the, the sum of 3 and 7? That's the 3 plus the sum of 7. What's that sum of 7? That's 7 plus the sum of the empty list, which is 0. And that's our, what's called, that is, by the way, it's what's called the base case. The base case is the place where we've gotten to the trivial solution. And then we can go back and say the zero. Oops. Now let me go back here. 
So the zero plus the seven plus the three plus the five will give us our answer. So that's what we want to do. We want to, to take the sum of a list as the value of the head plus the sum of whatever is left over in the list. And we keep doing this until we get to an empty list. And in that case, we're going to have a zero as our result. And then we'll have to climb back down our stack and put it back together. So here's our method called sum. If the head is, of the list is null, then we're going to return zero. Otherwise, we're going to take whatever data is in the head node and add that onto the sum of everything that's left. Remember, get next is going to give us a node that is going to refer to the rest of the list. And there's our recursion. The sum method is calling itself. Yeah, and this is the part where everybody says, you know, their, their heads just sort of explode. But again, it's exactly, the, it's exactly the same as what we did before, only different. So let's see what's happening here. Here we are in main, and we have our list, 5, 3, 7, and the empty, and the null, excuse me. And we're going to call the sum method. Okay, great. So now when we enter here, the head node is the 5 and its point ref reference to whatever comes next. Head is not equal to null. So we're going to return head.getData, which is 5, plus the sum of whatever is left over. Okay. That means we have to go in here and take the 3, and now we've called sum again. Head is not equal to null, so we're going to call getData plus the sum of whatever's left. That's 3 plus the rest of the list. Is, this, is everybody okay on this one? Do you need me to go over that part again? Okay, then we'll continue here. Now, I, I can't figure out what this whole thing works out to until I evaluate this, which means I'm going to have to call some one more time. I have to open up yet another stack frame. And now I'm going to say, okay, the head was now seven, and I want to return seven plus whatever's left over in the list. I can't calculate that until I've finished evaluating this. Yeah. Finally, I have a null, and that means I can return zero. Hooray, I don't have to go on hold anymore. I can I finally have a result that I can pass back to the person who called me. Hey, what happens? Again, two things happen. The return gets passed back to whoever called it earlier, and the stack frame disappears. So now I have the 7 plus 0. Now that I have the 0 here, and I know this is 7, I can return the 7 to whoever called me, because I finally have completed that sub-problem. I'm going to return it back to the um, last person, and then... I have a seven here. Remember, it replaces the call. And now I have three plus seven. I could take that three plus seven and hand it back because I now have my answer. It goes back to where I called it from the five plus whatever. And there's my 10. Now I have five plus 10, and I can finally return that to the main method and there's my 15. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm calling myself. I don't know. I've, I've, I have not done this before. Let's see if this works. Okay. Let me, well, well, let me do this. And by the way, I had one of the colorizations wrong, but I'll fix that later.
you can almost think of it this way. Let's say I had a whole bunch of different, um, let me hide the message window here. So if I called sum one, I would take the get data plus the sum two, and I would call another function. You're okay with fun calling another function, right? Or another method, okay? And then I'd call this other method with, with the remainder, and it would take the data plus whatever's in sum three, and that would take sum four, and eventually I would get down to returning zero, which would return the zero to here. And that was a seven plus a zero and so on. But all of these methods are exactly the same thing. They all have exactly the same code in them. So instead of having to write an, you know, a possibly infinite number of methods, some one, some two, some three, some four, some five, I have one method and I let it call itself. So what's happening here is as if I had that whole bunch of similar methods, but they all call one. But, but instead of having to write separate methods, I use the same one over and over again. Now, this is where a lot of the books give you this dire warning. They say, oh, this is, this is why recursion is just so difficult. Well, first of all, it's the same as methods calling another method except we don't have to write a different method. Okay? And then they say, oh, it's so expensive. There's so many resources that it takes up. Yes, that's true. Every time that we um, call it, we have to add an, another level of stack. Okay? Back in the day when um, Java was first starting out, yeah, machines were really small and not a lot of memory, and it was very expensive to do this. Okay, nowadays we have lots of memory. Now there's a limit on how many times you can call something before you run out of space on the stack. With Java, I think you can call 10,000 times before um, it, it blows out on you. And when it blows out, it's called a stack overflow because you have too many items on the stack. In Python, they set the limit as 1,000. So if I had a list of, let's say, 5,000 items, I could do it in Java. And it would um, allocate 5,000 stack frames. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, if I have a tree that's 5,000 levels deep, a tournament with lots 5,000 levels deep, then I'm going to, I might run into trouble. Yeah. If you have a, if you have a tournament that has that many levels where you need a thousand levels, you're probably doing a tournament wrong. Okay. So that's, a, that, that's what recursion is. You have a method that calls itself on a smaller version of the original problem until you get to something that is easy to solve and then you climb back down the stack. Um, let's take another example. Is it word the same forwards and backwards? And let's think about how we would do this by hand, okay? So is rotor a palindrome? Well, we look at the beginning and ending letters and if those are matching, we mentally discard them, and then we look at what's left over. Now we ask ourselves, is that a palindrome? So there's the same question we're asking, but we're asking it on a smaller version of the original. Okay. Well, we're going to do this exactly the same thing. We're going to check the first and last characters and see if they match. And if they do, we mentally discard them. And now we ask, okay, is this the same backwards and forwards? Again, we're asking the same question over and over again, but we're doing it on a smaller and smaller problem. And this is our base case. When we get one letter or zero characters left, yeah, one letter is the same forward as backwards. And if you have no letters left, like in the word noon, N-O-O-N, you get rid of the N's, you get rid of the O's, there's nothing left. Is nothing the same backwards as forwards? Yeah. And now we have our answer, yes. If at any point we got a mismatch between the beginning and ending value, then we'd have to say, no, we could stop right away. Is everybody okay with this, with this algorithm? And this is what we do. I mean, you want to check to see if something is the same backwards or forwards, you just look at the ends and then mentally discard them and keep going until you hit the middle. 
So this is recursive again, because we're asking the same question over and over again until we get down to a small enough case where we can give a definitive answer. And let's go through the stack frame here again to see how this works. So here I have um, is palindrome of a string S. Yeah. Um, let me check, by the way, to see if there's anything in the chat window, if there's anybody who has. Okay, nothing so far. By the way, if you have any questions, those of you who are on Zoom, just open up your microphone because I don't check the chat window very often. Okay. So here we are in Maine, and we're going to ask, I was going to use the word is palindrome, but I didn't have enough room on the right-hand side to do it, so I abbreviated to is pal, sorry. And we're going to give it the word rotor. And we want to save the result in our result. And let's look at this code before we start calling it. Okay. If the length of the string that we're giving it is less than or equal to one, we can return true. That's the base case. That's the case that is trivial. We can't go any further than that. Otherwise, if we have something that's bigger than one character, then we have to look at the first character and the last character and check to see that they're equal. If they are equal, then let's get the rest of the string. That's going to be the substring from one up to, but not including the last character. And say, okay, is that a palindrome? There's our recursive call. This method is calling itself on a smaller substring. And by the way, if the characters don't match, we can return false right away because there's no point in going further. If there's a mismatch, it can't be the same backwards and forward. Is everybody okay with this code? The idea. And let's see what happens when we do call this. Okay. So we have this whole string rotor. And the string length is greater than or equal to one. So we check. Do the beginning and ending characters match? Yes, they do. So the rest is going to be OTO. And we're going to now return the result of calling is pal with that smaller word. That means we have to go and open up a new stack frame. And this time the string is OTO. That's bigger than one. We check to see that the beginning and ending letters are the same. They are. What's the rest of the word? That's everything except the first and last letter, which is going to be the letter T. And now we say, okay, well, is that a palindrome? And we keep asking this question over and over again until we can finally get a definitive answer. And this time we have a string with one letter. And finally, we have a definitive answer. Yes, this one is definitely a palindrome. That means we can return true to whoever called us. And that true gets passed back here because we're going to return is pal of the rest, which was a true. And then we return true again from here. And we're done. So essentially what we're doing, like, yes, you could do this with a loop, but now we have a loop that doesn't need to have a loop in it. The loop is being done by the recursion. So that's a pretty cool idea. I mean, it's a very clever idea. For things like a palindrome and for the sum of a list, it's not the most exciting thing in the world. But again, I'm you know, you to please accept my word for it that when we get to things like trees, things that would be just incredibly difficult to do with a while loop become much more elegant and much more readable. And you also can use a mathematical foundation for it if you use recursion. Oh, I do I dare to say this? Okay, I'm just going to put this out here. How many of you have ever heard of something called proof by induction? Okay, I'm not going to go into detail on it, but recursion is essentially the same thing as proof by induction, if you think about it. You have to have base case, and then if that's true, then if n, n plus one, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's really the same thing. That's why there's a, a there is a mathematical basis. Let me just say there's a mathematical basis for this whole recursion thing. 
Okay, it's similar to something that happens a lot in mathematics. Okay, but obviously I will not go into detail on it because that's a whole nother lecture. Um, and this took me a incredibly less time than I thought it would take me. Yeah. But that's okay. Um, do you need me to go over any part of this again? Or do you need me to show you the program and that it actually works? That might be a good idea. Okay, so let's go here. And um, here's my recursive list add. Actually, I have four things in here, five, two, three, and eight. And then I'm going to get the sum of the list starting at the head of the list. So I should get, what's five and two is seven, three. I should get 18 when I'm done, done with this. Sure enough, it's 18. You know what I'm going to do here? Hmm. I'm thinking here, okay? What I'd like to do is show you what's happening as this is going along. To do this, I'm gonna, hmm, I'm trying to do this without without having to. Let's put some extra output in here, okay? I'm not sure if this is going to work well, but we'll, we'll find out in a moment. So I call this up with has eight, and then the eight returning eight with the sum of, uh, You remember when I added the list? In fact, let's do this here. There we go. I think that will make our output. So before adding, I'm calling the sum with head, and then I'm going to return eight plus. Oh, that, that's. I'm sorry, my boy. I, I can't. I had too many. I, I got confused over where my plus signs were. There we go. So I'm going to return eight plus the sum of the list starting with three. I call sum with the head as three, and that'll three plus the list starting at two, which calls sum with the head of two, and that'll return two plus the sum of the list starting at five. And finally, the head five returning the sum of the list starting at null. And I'm not sure where this one came. Oh, that, that, that was at the very end, right? And then that's where it came. So that, that, was, the, that was the sequence of calls. I'm not sure if that helps or not. Um, but I'm going to upload this one later on so you can see it, see it in action. And let's see if I have my, um, da, 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 where is it here? And here was this one. Uh, this one, I just little, allow you to enter a string here. So if I have rotor, rotor is a palindrome. If I say rotor, then it's not a palindrome. Uh, D 
you want me to put some output in here so you can see that also? Like I did in the other one? Okay. Save this and... And here, what we're going to do is There we go. I think that should do would be enough output to help us with this. So if I go here with rotor, let's see what happens here. So I have matching letters. I called it with OTO with one returning true. Let's say I do something like um what? Oh yeah, but that that's also okay. So the matching letters, and then it calls itself with the remainder CEC. I had matching letters. But if I say, let's say, um, so here I called it with ACEDA, the A is matched, and then I had CED, but the C doesn't match D, and so the false got returned all the way up to the stack. Um, just as an aside, what I wanted to do was I wanted to show you by a level of indentation um, how which call we were in. And I could do that, but I'd have to add another parameter to the call, and I don't want to do that, okay? If, it, if there's a demand for me to do it, I will. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I will put that in as, as – I'll, I'll write that during lab time. I'll write it for you, and then you can – so you can see that every time you call it, I'm going to indent a little bit more so you can see it a little more, a bit more clearly what's happening. And um, I'll let you look at the code. If you think it's good, great, okay? Uh, I don't want to go any further into the chapter at this point, okay? Because this is a lot of concept to understand. So I may as well do a lot of lab time today, I guess. First of all, you, uh, I don't know if y'all have finished. What was the last one that we had? A thousand exceptions. Okay, I don't think I've seen a lot of those coming in. And also, there may be some people who still have to do the unordered list um, one, where you add the methods to that. So people probably have plenty of stuff to work on on that. Have And the other thing I've done here, if you have finished them, and you want some more practice, though. Let's go here. Yeah, I might as well discuss this one. This, this is an interesting one. Okay. Stacks. This phone here. Okay. Yeah. Now, the question is, palindromes can also be phrased, but you need to remove the spaces and punctuation. 
And you'll need to change all the letters to lowercase. So for example, Madam, I'm Adam is a palindrome. If you get rid of all the commas and the spaces and the apostrophe, and then you put, put everything in lowercase, then you can use the palindrome method that we just looked at. So let's look at the starting point for this program here. And where did I put it here? Recursive palindromes, yes. So here what we're going to do is, given a string, we're going to return the string with only letters and all in lowercase. And here's the um, is palindrome. Right now I'm just returning false because it's the easiest thing in the world to do. And now I'm not gonna upload this right away, the stuff that I did, because otherwise you just have to copy and paste. Um, what I'll do is I'll upload the PDF into the example file. No, you can still copy and paste from the PDF. Yeah. Well, what the hell? I'll put up the PDF, and rather than copy and paste, you should probably look at it and try and recreate it yourself. Okay, that would probably be better a better exercise for you. And then here I have a test result method where I give it a string s, given a string, and what is expected or the ex what result it gets and what I expect it to be. So X radar and should return true. Hello should return false. The empty string should return true. Uh, Hannah should return true. And this should return true also. And also, if you want to, you can put in this code here. So you can type your own strings like race car. Yeah. How does it work? Pardon? Uh, Madam, I'm Adam. Yeah. They have the contraction and I'm so. Okay. okay. What we're going to do is we're going to somewhere in here. Um, test result of string S. You can say S becomes letters only of S. And what that's going to do is it's going to take out all the things that aren't letters. Yeah, so this is what you'll want to do here. Is you'll, you'll want to write in there. And then that'll get rid of the comma, the space, and the apostrophe, and the period. And now all you're left with after letters only sub s is done, you would have, and it's all going to be switched to lowercase. And then you could call is palindrome with that. Okay. So there's the trend. So you're going to have to write the is palindrome method, and also the letters only. Now, guarantee you that the first thing I did when I wrote this is I wrote the letters only as a while loop, that would, or a for loop. I don't know if there's a for or a while to go through the characters and build up the new string. Yeah, and you can do that if you want to. But if you want a real challenge here, make letters only a recursive method. So the question is, how will we make letters only a recursive method? Okay. So let's think about this. Yeah. I'm going to do a little bit of the design here. So let's say we have A, B, comma, C, D, E, slash, F, G. Okay. What I'm going to do is, yeah. question, is this a letter or not? Is A a letter? Great. So this is, let's, let's call this before, and here's after. Yeah. So great. I Now I have an A. because of, Now, let's look at the rest of the string. Okay? I want only the letters from this substring, don't I? So let's look at the B. Is that a letter? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. That means I have to add that on to whatever came on the other one. Now, let's look at the rest of the string and say, what are only the letters from that? This is a comma. Is that a letter? No, it isn't, which means I don't add it on to what used to come before. Instead, just give me the letters only from what's left. Again, I'm asking the same question, but with a smaller and smaller string every time. So my logic is going to be something like this. And let's do this without, what, by the way, what's my base case going to be? When am I going to have to stop? Yeah. 
yeah okay so if the um the string equals the empty string then i'll just return that okay otherwise look at the first character if it's a letter then return that letter as a string you'll have to convert it to a string plus only the letters from what's left over if it's not a letter then i'm going to ignore it and i'm going to return only the letters from what's left over and there is my recursive call so if I have a letter, I'm going to return that letter and then add on the letters from what's left over. When I would got to this string here with the comma CDE slash FG, it wasn't a letter. So what I want to return as the letters only is going to be the letters from what's left over. I don't want to add the comma in on that. I'll save this as um, I want to balance my braces there. Yeah, but that's the idea of doing it recursively. Instead of writing a loop, I just say, okay, the first letter, if the first character is a letter, then I have to say, keep that letter plus all the letters from what's left over. If I don't have a letter as the first one, then I just throw it away and say, well, give me what's in the letters from everything that's left over. And when I get down to the, e the empty string, I'm going to return the empty string. I think that's the correct base case. So there we have it. Well, it has to return a string anyway, okay? Um, this is a little bit tricky, okay? But that's why, that's why I said this. you have to think carefully about the base case and how you make a recursive call to use a smaller string that approaches the base case. I decided to do this analysis for you again you i'm gonna see what i'll upload everything here uh, feel free to try it on your own if you're going to be doing this lab try it on your own and only look at the code if you get totally stuck how's that sound okay, and let me just check to see if i have anything in the chat here nope okay um let me stop recording here for the moment